After another training montage, which isn't terribly exciting, and some more fighting among the Shadow Dancers, which also isn't terribly exciting, we return to Iraq where Hashim's contact is unfortunately discovered by Yusuf. <laughs> Somehow, getting shot in the head produces no blood splatter whatsoever. You'd think they could have at least squirted some ketchup on the monitor or something. It's not like they had to tone down the violence or anything. This movie was rated R. Yusuf takes the opportunity to send a fake message to Hashim, telling him the launch has been postponed by three weeks. Meanwhile, the Shadow Dancers are getting some much-needed R&R at the local watering hole. Oh, hi, Jim Wynorski. Predictably, it doesn't take these fools long to get into an argument with the locals, and somehow this leads to Lee making a bet that Allie can beat them in pool. They take the bet, and of course she starts running the table. She sure does know how to use a stick. And by stick, he means penis. And I thought I knew how to handle my balls. And by balls, he means... Balls. What do you mean? Yeah, yeah, he's a foreigner, we get it. Allie's victory at the pool table leads to the typical bar fight that always happens in these types of movies, and after finishing their drinks and busting a few heads, they decide to call it a night. The next day, Bobby, Anthony, and Allie head to a local airfield to have some fun with an old biplane and pad the movie's running time, while the rest stay behind to check the latest email from Hashim's contact. Suddenly, the base is invaded by a bunch of Iraqi soldiers. How they found this place is anyone's guess. Keep in mind, this mission is supposed to be completely off the record, and apart from an admiral and two generals, no one knows they're here. Yet somehow, these Iraqi troops got into the country, smuggled in assault weapons or acquired them after arrival, and found an unofficial military installation that no one knows about. There's plot convenience, and then there's this. They also somehow found Bobby, Allie, and Anthony at the airfield. And of course, they're all wearing masks or helmets in a failed attempt to hide the fact that these Iraqi terrorists are clearly a bunch of white guys. While Lee and company fight off the attackers on the base, Anthony runs away from two helicopter pilots who somehow manage to land nearby without detection. Allie spots the trouble and swoops down to the runway, allowing Anthony to jump onto the wing. He holds on for dear life as they take off and are chased by the two copters. And of course, this is where the stock footage kicks in again. Much like the training montage, all of the close-up shots of the actors in the plane, or in Lenny's case on the wing, were of course shot by Wynorski. The rest of the aerial footage comes from 1978's Capricorn 1, another film I don't really recommend. It's not an especially bad film, but apart from this scene, it's kinda boring. Unlike the training montage, Wynorski does a fairly decent job of blending the stock footage with his own. Sure, if you look at it closely, you can tell something's up. The Capricorn 1 footage is 20 years older than his, and it shows. But it's not bad for what it is. Anyway, since the plane just happens to be armed for crop dusting, how goddamn convenient, they use the pesticide as a makeshift smokescreen and force the copters to crash into the mountainside. And the boys back at the base easily deal with the ground troops. Quick, think of a witty one-liner. Watch that first step. Ha <laughs> ha. Nailed it. Since they've been discovered by the Iraqis, somehow, Lee suspects Hashim's contact in the Middle East has been compromised. Hashim agrees as something about his last email didn't look right. It was a salutation. Well, he gave it right. Hello, my friend. No, that's incorrect. It's hello, old friend. This whole plan by the Iraqis really confuses me. I assume the email was meant to convince the Shadow Dancers to postpone the attack so the Iraqis would have time to launch the missile. But taking the fight directly to them had the opposite effect, and they're leaving the next day. No wonder they lost the Gulf War. They had no idea what the fuck they were doing. Before they leave for the mission, Streets presents Hashim with his brand new green card. He's officially a legal resident of the United States. He's gonna die, isn't he? Before they leave, all of the Shadow Dancers are asked to write a letter to their next of kin, just in case. Since Hashim's family is dead, he writes his letter to Lee. Yep. He's worm food. Well, for once, it's not the black guy. Also, remember when Anthony defended Ali's honor in that one scene? Well, because of that, she now has the hots for him. Several weeks after the fact, and she asks him out. The guy who wrote the screenplay gets the girl. What are the odds? The next day, they head to some place that looks almost, but not quite, entirely unlike Iraq, and very much like Southern California, and proceed to bombard the base where the missile is kept. This time, most of the stock footage comes from a combination of Iron Eagle 1 and 2. Two more films I don't recommend. Wynorski can sure pick them, can he? 
It looks no worse than the training scenes earlier in the film, although it appears the Iraqis are flying Israeli fighter jets, which is unlikely to say the least. And sure enough, Hashim is blasted out of the sky by an enemy fighter. Well, I sure hope somebody picks up that phone. Do what? Because I f***ing called it! But his death was not in vain as Lee takes out the missile and the Western world is saved. USA! 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 Eagle One, permission to fly in missing man formation. Roger that. Permission granted. <laughs> Wait, cancel that. I just remembered we don't have any stock footage of a missing man formation. Sorry. And after a very short scene of Hashim's funeral, accompanied by a voiceover of his letter to Lee, which basically amounts to thanks for everything and God bless America and all that, the movie just ends. I could make a joke here about how I spent two whole dollars on this movie and I will never get that back, but honestly, I expected far worse. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's a good movie. The premise was pretty stupid, the characters are derivative, the special effects that didn't come from stock footage, and sometimes the ones that did weren't very good. The acting was subpar overall, most of our heroes are woefully miscast, and the villains were far too incompetent to be intimidating. This movie is bad, but not offensively so. It's well shot considering the budgetary constraints, and Abel and Hayduk were actually pretty good in this. Even Daniel Baldwin was at least passable. It's also one of those rare examples of a B-movie that isn't teeming with sex and gore. In fact, there's none of either. Whether that's good or bad comes down to your personal tastes. In the end, for two bucks, I can honestly say I got my money's worth and then some. If you have a few bucks lying around and you want to have a few laughs at the expense of a cheap, cut-and-paste B-grade action movie, I'm sure you could do far worse than Desert Thunder. That's all for today. Next time, we'll take a look at another B-movie that's a bit more recent, much more well-known, and infinitely sillier. Until then, I'm the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. Boogie boogie. Oh, boogie boogie. <laughs>